what's the format? You ask questions, or the I'll or ask what? you questions, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. And audio sync. There's water there for you. Okay. There's tissues if you need them, and all right. Good to go. Let her rip. Rolling. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Sam Carter on February 27, 2020 at 3.30 p.m. We're located at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we begin, could you please state and spell your first and last name for the transcriber? I'm Samuel D. Carter, S-A-M-U-E-L. My surname is spelled C-A-R-T-E-R. -E Thank you. Before we talk about your experiences in the military, I'd like to get a little biographic information. When and where were you born? I was born in 1951 in the Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Virginia. In Virginia. Who were your family members? Well, my father was a chief petty officer in the Navy at the time, and uh, my mother was a uh, homemaker and housewife at that time, though she had been employed uh, previous to that. And I had an older sister when I was born. Yeah. Uh, so your dad was a chief petty officer? That means you had 18 years of boot camp. Well, pretty much. My dad <laughs> and his brother uh, were part of a family that lived on a farm east of here for 150 years. And during the Depression, they gave it up. One went to the Army and one went to the Navy. They never looked back. They never both looked back. from the service. <laughs> they looked back, you know, fondly, but they did had, had no intention of returning to cotton farming. Yeah, I can understand that. I picked cotton a couple of days when I was a kid, never again. It's tough work. Tough work. Uh, so you were a Navy brat? Yes. Uh, what do you consider your hometown? How many times did you move? We moved some. Um, my dad got out of the Navy in uh, 1956 when I was uh, five years old. He had his last sea duty then. Mm. And uh, that was, we were living in Jacksonville in Florida at the time. And then later, uh, he got in the construction business, and then uh, that's boom and bust in Florida. He wound up going back to work for the government in Pensacola, and we moved to that Navy town, and I did some growing up there also. But then uh, I got to be about uh, 17 years old, and you might say I wasn't thriving, and uh, it became my lot to go to military school. So I did that, found out I liked it, and joined the Army, an accelerated commissioning program, uh, when I was 17 years old. Wow. So, I was an eager, they had the lottery a few months later and I drew 352, it didn't matter to me. I, I wanted into the You service. wanted in? Yes. Uh, what military school? I went to Marion Military Institute in Marion, Alabama. Alabama, I've spoken there. Oh yeah, you, see, you know the, the yeah. neighborhood. It's I a, know it's where a, it is. 1842, they've been around a long time, and my mother had gone to Judson College in the same town as had my sister. So when uh, my father and I uh, got confrontational over haircuts and things like that in the 60s, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion. <laughs> you were going to end up there. And it worked out great. Uh, now, how did that work? You were finishing high school mm -hmm. at Marion. Right. And how do you get commissioned? Does well, it, it go on into college? Yeah, they, in, in, they have a, uh, there were nine military junior colleges in the country at the time. There are much, many fewer than that now. They had a prep school and they had a two-year um, junior college program. Mm. They offered advanced ROTC in the freshman and sophomore years. And I had not taken the whole basic course, but it was explained to me by the professor of military science over there that I could go to basic training at Fort Benning or an abbreviated basic camp and then come back to school and be an advanced or OTC and I would be paid the princely sum of $50 a month, Ooh. which 
uh, came in handy. Yeah. Um, so that's what I did. I went to basic training uh, summer after I graduated from high school at uh, Harmony Church at Fort Benning. That was a formative experience as it is for everybody that goes. Nothing like them chiggers and sand and heat. And you, you learn a lot. When you're, you, when you're a 17 year old, my platoon was mostly composed of college graduates that wanted two more years of law school or graduate school to avoid the draft. Uh, the draft. So they signed up for ROTC and got that one deed deferred. <coughs> um, so I was, uh, I was pretty young and green at age 17 and uh, was, a, as I said, a formative experience. Yeah, they'll knock that out of you. Grow up fast. So what year are you finally commissioned? Well, I finished <clears throat> two years of school, uh, the junior college course at Marion, and uh, that would have been in 1971. And I was discouraged by the staff of the military department there from taking my commission at that time. I would have been but 19 years old. And in 1971, at age 19, uh, I deferred to them, even though I couldn't wait to get in. It was great advice. I went down to uh, Florida State and uh, had a what we might call a career detour for less two, than a year. Two years or yeah, a year? No, then I went back. I, I didn't finish it at Florida State. I went into the Army. Um, in uh, the same month that the last uh, hostile fire casualties were taken in Vietnam, June of 72, I went on active duty. So I would have been about a sophomore and a half in uh, terms of education at that point in time. I was one of the very, very few. Now were you commissioned or yes. sent to, sent to uh, officer training or anything like that? I went straight down to the uh, professor of military science at Florida State and uh, walked in and didn't have, uh, I hadn't had a haircut in a while. I'd reverted to uh, pre-military status during my respite. I told this old NCO, I said, I believe you're the custodian of my military record folder. I'd like for you to look me up. I want to see the PMS. He said, I doubt it. He walked over there and looked in the file and I gave him my name and he said, yeah, and he opened it up. There's a picture of me, and he says, you need to go get a haircut you before you see Colonel Frontenheim. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out and got some white sidewalls and a landing strip. <clears throat> yep. Came back, and uh, it turns out that they were about to commission a whole class of officers. And uh, they wanted to know what my branch selection would be because they have an order of merit list in their OTC departments. And the higher you finish, the more likely it is that you get your choice of, your branch choice. Well, like I said, it was 1972, and uh, he asked me what my choices were. I said, infantry, armor, and artillery in that order. And he says, you're gonna get exactly what you want. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, I had finished as a distinguished military student, which is an ROTC designation, and you get a regular commission with that if you have your degree. I didn't get the degree, so I didn't get the regular commission. So I took the reserve commission and went on active duty, happy as, as I could be. And what branch? Infantry? Infantry? Fort Benning. Fort Benning, Georgia. And I raised my hand for everything. Give me all of it. Give me it. Give me yeah. it. Now, once you chose infantry, you've already been through infantry basic at Benning. Uh, do you go through officer basic, or that figure that's yeah, taken I care went, of? <clears throat> I went to uh, Marion was, uh, as uh, military schools go in those days, was pretty rigorous. Um, no civilian clothes, no television, three weekends off a semester. Oh. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty strict. Sounds like a junior prison. Uh, it was uh, what we would I would call a highly regimented environment. <laughs> so 
I'd been there, and when I was on this track one ROTC program, I, my summer between uh, freshman and sophomore years, I went to an ROTC camp at Fort Bragg. So they, when I went on active duty, I went to the infantry officer basic course, then I went to the airborne course, I went to the ranger course, got bumped out of there. I found out you have to have two very good legs to be a ranger. I only oh. have one good leg, and the other one kept me from being successful in that. And then they sent me to the garden spot, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Oh, poor fella. Yeah. That ain't good. No, um, Polk is uh, pretty undesirable for, from a lot of perspectives. Old sergeant once told me, if you want to give the world an enema, Fort Polk is a place to stick <laughs> the plug in. Yeah, it's, it was pretty much a cultural wasteland back in those days. Now, the Army spent a lot of money down there. Yeah, they, I'm told that they renovated it pretty good. I'm a lu I'm such a lucky fellow. You know, <laughs> the Army sent me to Fort Polk. And then after I got out of the Army, I went to work for a, a big contractor who did a lot of federal work, and he sent me to Fort Polk. Oh. Well, then they put me on another job in Louisiana, and this is, and I, I joined the Louisiana Army National Guard and commanded a company down there. 356. Go straight back. 256. 256 Brigade, 256 brigade yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so. I was down there covering them when they were alerted for uh, uh, the Iraq War. Mm -hmm. And uh, they packed them all off to Fort Hood and they mutinied. Well. Or so it was presented. Well, you know, you hear about They that wanted to go home for Christmas, and the Army said no, and they chartered themselves a Greyhound and left. Well, that sounds about right. Yeah. You know, the Army never has understood the National Guard. No. They don't. And, you know, if you listen to uh, people who know what they're talking about, it's ROTC officers and draftees and National Guardsmen who do most of the heavy lifting. Not recently, but in our big linear wars, that's where the manpower comes from, in a lot of cases. Those, th that 256 had a battalion surgeon who was 73 years old. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I, I mean, interviewed him. Yeah, if he's effective. Yeah. So that's the big difference in the guard. Can, is the guy effective? Can he do the job? Right. First yeah. time I made a parachute jump after I got out of the Army, I was in the, I'd signed up for the 20th Special Forces Group. And they said, uh, I've gotten out of the Army. I wasn't going to be in the Guard and Reserve because I didn't want to be Christmas help or anything like that. I didn't have a high opinion of them. And I got hungry. I had a wife and two kids. was going back to school on GI Bill, and all of a sudden that, that Guard money looked pretty good to me. <clears throat> so the Georgia Guard wouldn't put me on. I mean, I couldn't get in. I, mean, I got a lot of ancestors <laughs> that, that worked their way through a lot of battlefields with what became the Georgia Guard, but I couldn't get in. It was a country club type thing. Somebody said, well, go call, go to Alabama and see the 20th group. And I called them up and they said, uh, well, send us your resume. I said, well, a, a military resume. I said, I don't have a military resume. I'll send you a Form 66. I said, you're not a listening, Captain. Send a military resume. Up, cook one up, sent it over there. They called back in another day. What are you doing Saturday? I said, uh, I'm available. He said, Come and see us. I went over there. I met uh, some pretty distinguished individuals. Um, right off the bat, met a Medal of Honor winner. Uh, met George Marichek, if you know that name. Um, met the RA advisor, the group commander, and a couple of other people, and they looked me over and we had a little quick talk and said, you're in. When was the last time you made a parachute jump? I said, in 72, a long time ago. And he said, well, get in your car and drive down to the airhead and see Sergeant so-and-so. We're jumping this morning. <laughs> I went down there and saw this sergeant. He had some big old pork chop sideburns like they had back in the 70s. He didn't look like much. Had a pretty good sized gut on him, too. Hmm. He got me briefed up <clears throat> on the MC-1 steerable canopy parachute and had me in the harness, and I was out the door within an hour of getting to that airport. Oh, my word. They did not fool around. 
that you make a successful jump? Oh, yeah, I made many of them with those guys. <laughs> and I, I had a completely new idea about the guard after now that. Now i got to tell you that I spent two weeks with an Alabama Guard Special Forces A team in Mirabali, Haiti. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I wound up commanding an A detachment in that unit for a year. Yeah. Out of A company, out of Montgomery. And uh, we had units in, um, back in those days, we had a battalion in Florida, one in Alabama, and one in Mississippi. It's scattered out a lot more now. But we had a huge exercise every year out in uh, Idaho and uh, brought people from all over the place. It was pretty impressive. I was, if you, when you realize the Guard only gets about five cents on the dollar compared to what the regular Army gets, they're quite a bargain. Mm -hmm. And it allows guys like me that weren't happy in the peacetime army to keep a hand in it and stay busy with it. It's a bargain. I accompanied the RSOC commander and the deputy SOCOM commander on a tour of all 32 A-teams in Haiti during our incursion there. 32 detachments? Yeah. From how many groups? It must have been from oh, some they were, from the 20th, and the, their affiliator used to be with the 5th. Yeah, the 5th. <clears throat> I think there were some from the 7th. And their interpreter, who spoke Creole, mm -hmm. was an Air Force guy. They pulled out of Lake in Heath, England, and assigned him to be the spokesperson. The skill inventory that's available in a in a National Guard Special Forces group is absolutely astonishing. Mm. I had, on that A detachment I took over, I had a former uh, UDT guy, what they call a SEAL now. I had two enlisted rangers, which you didn't see back in those days very often. Um, had one guy that wound up on Delta Force in a, in a later assignment. These guys were all school teachers, worked for the phone company and police officers, and they, they were, we were talent rich, like you wouldn't believe. Worked out great. It's a good experience for me. Could you describe for us your friendships with and your impressions of the officers and NCOs that you served with? I was uh, blessed and deeply fortunate to have met some outstanding people. I'll take them in, in some of them in order. I won't be able to remember all of them, but when I was at Fort Polk, one of my beer drinking buddies was a second lieutenant named Joe Hooper, who was a Medal of Honor winner and probably, the, I'd say probably the most highly decorated person to come out of the war in Vietnam. Terrific fellow. He and I were second lieutenant training officers. Of course, he'd been an NCO and they made him an officer and, why they did that, I don't know, <clears throat> but Joe was a, uh, and it's just, has, has been my great good fortune to have met about a half a dozen Medal of Honor winners. Um, recipients. recipients. We don't call them winners. Yeah, they, they wouldn't, certainly. They don't. They wouldn't consider themselves a winner. Most of them will tell you that uh, they're wearing it for other people. So, they, all, all of them. Uh, humble. Battle I was in and wrote the book about had three Medal of Honor recipients. Yeah, they're, uh, they're unique individuals, people that uh, circumstances force them into discovering what their gifts are. And their gifts, I think, almost straight across the board is that they remain cool under fire and they know what to do and they have no fear. That's not too many people are blessed with that genetic combination, but those guys got it and they were in the circumstances and knew what to do and they certainly are worthy of emulation. I met Joe down there and then there were uh, many others. I had a dozen drill sergeants in the company that I was with and being with those NCOs for a year all day, every day was a good experience for me. I think uh, we ran through about six or eight basic training cycles a basic training is uh, something that's not well understood outside the military and um, is a, another one of those great formative experiences. I left Fort Polk 
because I'd met this nurse down there. And uh, she wanted to get married, and I didn't. She said, well, I'm, I'm going to transfer. That's not going to happen. So go ahead. She did. Six weeks later, I was hitchhiking my way to Korea. When I got there, I asked her to marry me, and she agreed, of course. You may have heard part of that story already. And uh, so then I, I'm in, in Korea, 8,000 miles from home, and thinking, I need to get myself reassigned very badly. So I flew back and stopped in uh, uh, Washington on the way. I didn't even have to go to the office. I called the assignments officer up and told him what I wanted to do. And those people are notoriously difficult to deal with. He said, Lieutenant, it's your lucky day. I got two open billets. I got one for Korea, which is what you're talking about, but I got another one here for Thailand. Which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough choice. But I decided to go with her, and I went to Korea. Yeah, probably was, the smart thing. Yeah, it was a great choice for me because I went to an infantry battalion um, at Camp Casey. Uh, first day I was there, my battalion commander got me squared away. That was Colin Powell. Um, the division commander was uh, General Henry, Henry Emerson, gunfighter. They gunfighter called Emerson, friend the of mine. The corps commander was General Hylingsworth. And the Army commander was General Stilwell. Now, that is a constellation of stars that you That's could not replicate anywhere. Nowhere. Where could you find that much talent before or since? You had to go to World War II to find that kind of. Well, I can give you two battalion commanders out of Vietnam who were the very best. Well, One of them is uh, General Hal Moore. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, General Dick Cavazos, mm -hmm. and they they were <clears throat> absolutely superb battlefield commanders. And they were both guys who were brought up in the Brown Shoe Army, in in uh, what uh, Corporal Sledge called the Old Breed Marine Corps. They'd been exposed to. A they were both in Korea as company right. commanders, and then Vietnam as battalion right. and brigade commanders. They were shaped by people that had been in the big fight. Yep. And they knew how to operate, and they knew how to lead. So when I went to Korea, and I think it was uh, General Powell that wrote this, said it was the last brown shoe unit in the army. Mm. And you. It ruined me. <laughs> we were in the field all the time. I became a platoon leader. Um, th this is the kind of thing that happened. I get there on the first day. I meet Colonel Powell. We have an interesting conversation. And he says, uh, it's New Year's Day. He said, and we're in the field, of course. He said, we just failed the division mortar test. So you're going to the mortar platoon, and you're staying out there until they pass the test. Oh, <laughs> New Year's Day in right. Korea, right. in so, the field. So here comes it's a little the, chilly out there. This is how cold it was. My company commander <clears throat> rides up, a guy I learned to really admire a lot. He knew the business, and he knew how to command at the company level. What year is this, by the by? 74. 74. Mm -hmm. So... Company commander rides up, he's in a Jeep. It's, it might be 10 degrees. Um, no canvas, no windshield on the vehicle. General Emerson ruled out canvas and windshields. <laughs> so I go over to the supply room and they load me up. And you get a lot of stuff when you go in a cold weather area like that. I'd never seen Mickey Mouse boots. I'd never seen a parka. I didn't know about the wolf fur and all that business. I found out quick. So I was in the back of that Jeep headed to the oh. water platoon within 30 minutes. We got up there and we drove up and the platoon's at the range. And we drive up and this really haggard looking NCO walks up. He reports and company commander says, uh, what in the hell is going on here, Sergeant Hubbs? There were a bunch of guys standing around an old hex tent, which was burned down. 
And they'd gotten in there and hit the happy smoke the night before and forgot to put the, didn't have any diesel, of course, so they put gasoline in the heater. In the didn't, heater. Didn't add the motor oil, and it got hot and burned up. And burned up the firing uh, charts and <laughs> the, uh, it, it burned up everything. And they're, they're taking the division mortar test. It already failed it. Then they burned down the fire direction center. Oh, good. So the company commander wasn't there two minutes. He said, you're in charge, Lieutenant. Drove off. And um, I didn't know a whole lot about mortars. <laughs> <laughs> and you got no firing charts. Yeah, I'm a pretty fast learner. We started off with uh, the Sergeant Hubs. And I knew enough to know that there's another fire direction center or something because they can they can jump them. He said, "Well, it's it's back at the uh, at Camp Casey." I said, "Well, get it up here." He said, "We can. It's on a truck, and the truck's broken down." Got the motor sergeant and the big chain and dragged that thing up there. And they'd made a homemade Winnebago. They built a plywood box on the back of it, and it's illegal, and they weren't supposed to take it out there. But we dragged that thing up there with a the chain, and it took about eight or ten days. We, After two or three tries, we got them through that. <laughs> that was my introduction to uh, how it gets done in Korea, and it was like no other part of the Army I was ever with. Yeah, we did... Uh, live fire exercises over there with napalm and now you grenades. you described the superb leadership up your chain of command in korea right what about other places that you served what's the leadership well af after i was in korea <clears throat> uh, i wanted to transfer to the 509th in italy but my darling bride was opposed to that so we came back to the States and they assigned us both to Fort Benning, of course. Of course. And I went to the infantry school. And uh, the chain there was not nearly as uh, speckled as you can imagine. Uh, it was spattered, I would call it. And This <clears throat> is 1975? 75. Mm -hmm. So Army get, was in pretty bad shape. Oh, kicking kicking officers out by ah. thousands. Army was, see, I thought the army was like Korea. When I came back to Fort Benning, oh, I found no. no, no, you ought to have seen it in Germany. Oh, I know the NCOs were under arms in the barracks out they, there at to night. go through their barracks. The first sergeant was carrying Siren. a forty-five with one in the chamber and the hammer back, holding it like this. Otherwise, he wasn't going to make it out the other door alive. We had issues, similar issues to Germany and Korea, but between General Emerson and uh, his, his officers, you know, when General Emerson has a sensitivity session with you, you get dialed in pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And there's no misunderstanding in that division. It's incredible how dialed in you get when there's strong leadership. Never, never seen anything like that. Before. I've got to tell you that Hal Moore was uh, S3 of Korea, mm -hmm. and he gets a call at midnight from his commander, uh, go up to uh, the second division and take it over. And oh, by the way, they're burning their barracks. <clears throat> he went up there, they were in riot. Yeah, there were problems like that over there. Um, but they got put to bed. We had a we had an, a night over there one night and over 70 soldiers were cut in a, a dispute over who owned what part of the ville. Yeah. The village was segregated. Yeah. And some guys from one tribe went into another tribe's area, and they had, a, had to have a, a, a resolution. A knife fight over yeah, it. A big knife fight. A lot of people got put in jail. A lot of problems down there. Yeah. Uh, my company commander didn't have any problem understanding how we needed to deal with these people. We had a guy that had a bunch of problems. He'd been an AWOL apprehension officer when he was on uh, recovery from wounds in Vietnam He'd, in New York City. <laughs> he kept his own hand irons and his own leg irons. He just kept them with him. Yep. I saw him cuff a man one night, both ends, put him in the back of a five-quarter, and they hauled him off in sub-freezing weather 
in the back of that pickup truck. Now I guess he just rolled around back there until he got down to the uh, only jail that they had was down at the Air Force Base. <laughs> we never saw him again. I mean, we, they dealt in the riots. They started that expeditious discharge program, which, and this was the interesting experience for me. When I went into Korea, it was a platoon of draftees. And uh, when I left, it was a platoon of two-year regulars. And the Army made a terrible, terrible deal when they did away with the draft. Yeah. And they still hadn't gotten over it. No, I agree. Not, and will not get over it until they reinstitute the draft and draft off the top instead of the bottom. Yeah. That's the problem. And they need to get that sorted out because we're going to need a bigger army. The army is too small, and there's not enough shooters right now, in my opinion. But those guys, when you when you're in a chain of command like that, things are different. Well, I went over to Fort Benning, and we had we had some I met some really uh, strong people. General Depew was running the training and doctrine command at that time. I went to the weapons department and became. Uh, uh, tow and dragon anti-tank guided missile guy. I, I was an anti-tank platoon leader in Korea for a good while. And we, uh, the Pew was, it turned the army upside down, the, at least the training and doctrine side of the thing. I mean, and he gave them a good shake and they needed it badly. Well, the Pew's strongest point was firing everybody who came under his eyeballs. You know, so much so when yeah. he had the first division in Vietnam that the Pentagon basically put an order out that just because you've been relieved as battalion commander by Bill DePew doesn't reflect badly on your career. And it shouldn't have. You know, you could get fired in the Army in World War II. I think it was Ricks or somebody who wrote that book and said, just because you got fired didn't mean you weren't going to get another chance down the road. Yeah. It just meant you got to be made an example of because you failed. Yeah. And commanders cannot fail. We don't count We don't failure. allow that. Yeah. It ain't allowed. So he fired him. And I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm reading uh, uh, oral history of General DePew right now. He was one of the most rational um, officers that I was ever around when I was in the Army. We did a lot of changes when he was around. A lot of people didn't like him. A lot of people didn't like him. But there were mostly people that couldn't handle him. So I had that experience at Fort Benning when we were making all these changes and worked for some some excellent officers. I worked for a lieutenant colonel one time and had too many years in special forces, I guess. And uh, we were in a big conference, had about 13 major generals in the room, and uh, including General DePew. And somebody said something about the dragon and asked him a question about it. He said, it'll never be fired in combat. I mean, this was a weapon that was standard A. It was in there. Uh, well, Colonel, why would you say something like that? He said, because it's unmanly, sir. To fire the dragon at the enemy, you must sit down in his sight, put the weapon on your shoulder, spread your legs, fire the weapon, and hold that position for 10 seconds, and you're within range of uh, light machine gun fire. That's straight talk. That'll keep you ever getting promoted to colonel. Yeah, it sure will. <laughs> he retired as lieutenant colonel. Great guy. I mean, just a super officer. You don't meet many like that. And he was telling the truth he about that. Unvarnished. So <laughs> I noticed that that kind of behavior at Fort Benning was uh, treated very differently than it was in Korea. Yeah. So the Army changed a lot while I was in there, and I elected to get out of the Army. I'd applied for a regular Army commission and uh, got it. Everybody told me I was crazy. You're never going to get that. We're kicking officers out by the droves. But you got a regular commission? What year? Um, 76. 76. How much longer did you stay? About six months. That's it? 
I applied for the commission and it took a year or so. There were officers that were suing the Army in those days over these promotions. And there was a lot of consternation in the Army. It was a bad time, as you bad time? Have, have alluded to. So they had these boards and then they wouldn't announce the results. So I waited. You know, I was in a, um, in a queue, didn't know where I was going to go, and I was trying to decide whether I was going to do this or not. And I uh, went to the range one day. I was working for a particularly unpleasant uh, colonel. And he wanted grass mowed all the time and wanted the rocks painted. And the grass didn't get mowed as close as he wanted it mowed. And uh, he jumped me about it and wanted to know what it was going to take. And I told him, frankly, I said, uh, we get some help out of here. The next day I was out there and my section chief, who was a major, was running the lawnmower. And I said, I'm done here. That's it for me. If majors got to mow the lawn. I'm out. I'm getting out of the Army. <laughs> so I'd applied for the regular commission. And back in those days, drinking was part of the routine in the military, unhappily, but that's how things were. And um, I'd been, we had these hails and farewells every month at the officers club and they had announced that uh, that I'd got the regular army commission and it was a nice room. And about three or four months later I told them I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Wow. If I told them I'd become an axe murderer, the reception wouldn't have been any different. Or a stage dancer in New York. Right. You get it. You know, <laughs> you know the drill. I, I'm telling you. I mean... It was like I was persona non grata. And I got out of the Army, um, I guess, first day of 1977, just about in there, and started school a day or two later. Went back to school at Auburn. And uh, what kind of degree world. did you take? Well, I, I wanted to get two degrees. I wanted to get a degree in architecture and I wanted a degree in building construction. I, I've been fortunate all my life of knowing what I wanted to do. I wanted to be do some soldiering and I got that chance and then, then I wanted to do some building and I've been doing that ever since. And I would like to um, have a farm. That part hasn't worked out yet, but I'm still hopeful. So I went to Auburn for uh, Took me about three years. I changed major a time or two, and uh, that's when I got into the uh, National Guard and had this awakening, this whole other military experience. I mean, Marion was a, a very a structured existence and a distinct military experience. Going to uh, Korea was just as distinct and different. Fort Benning was another type of military experience, one that I did not enjoy, although I loved instructing and I loved briefing. I briefed everybody, congressmen, senators, visiting dignitaries, all kinds of people. One time a protocol officer told me, he said, you know, Captain Carter, you always seem to get along real well with all these dignitaries and these generals we bring in here. What, what do you attribute that to? I said, it's easy. That general and I both know something. We've achieved the highest rank we're ever going to. <laughs> Made it easy for me. So that, I had these very different and distinct military experiences and my experiences in the Guard were just- Question distinct. for you. Mm -hmm. Describe the worst day you had during your military service. I'd have to study. Um, Maybe your mortar platoon. No, I had that. That was one of the more interesting days, but I, 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 I navigated my way out of that one. I tried one thing <clears throat> in the Army and didn't get it done. And I, I'm, I'm still um, unhappy about that result. As I mentioned earlier, I have uh, I got a weak leg. It's a joint problem. And I was assigned to the ranger school six weeks before the class started. 
and they had two second lieutenants out there, and one of them ran, we were called snowbirds. If you hang around before the class starts, you're a snowbird. So <clears throat> they exercised us on the, uh, one of them had us in the morning and one in the afternoon. They'd run us through the obstacle course till we collapsed. And then we'd clean rifles or wash barracks or do some other, you know, dirty jobs all day long waiting on this class to start. No rank in ranger school in those days. And then we'd go to uh, the other second lieutenant in the afternoon. He'd run us until we collapsed. Running in combat, the Army in those days was very cavalier about their labor because they had to draft. They had an unlimited supply of people trying to get in the gate. They've learned differently. Um, on my first day at that course, they had 160 people show up, I think, maybe for about 120 slots. And they had this old one-legged NCO get up there and told us up front, I'll run you till we get down to 120. And he said, I know you're wondering how I'm going to do that with just one leg. He blows a whistle, a pickup truck rolls up, and there's a lawn chair in the back of it. <laughs> oh, dear. And he, he ran us for miles and miles, I don't know how far, until enough people, nearly enough people dropped out. They did a nose count or head count, had a few more, they duck walked us until they got down to that number. People fell falling out with hamstrings and what have you. Were you still made in? It, made it through that. And they always say if you can get through that first three weeks at Benning to get through the map course, you're going to make it. That's a lie. <laughs> uh, I made it through the first three weeks, but my leg went out from under me. I had to go on sick call. Bam. You are gone. You're out of here. Yeah. So I did a lot. Now it's hard to get people enough rangers. So they're, uh, they have recycling and extra training, and they send you to a pre-ranger and a lot of other things before you go. So. I, I believe now, and I have no contact with the Army anymore to speak of, but I think they've become a lot more attuned to running labor. Now, I'm in the labor business, in the construction business, and I can tell you right now, in America, if you don't treat people right, they'll walk you. And they'll walk you for nothing. They'll walk you for 25 cents an hour. You better learn servant leadership. Yeah. And I think the Army had to learn that, and I believe they have. I think they look after their people a lot better. Describe for me the best day you had during your service. Hmm. That's related to the Army. Probably something to do with my dad. Um, my dad was especially proud that uh, that I'd gotten a commission. And uh, of course, the worst day I had in the army may have been the day I told my dad I was getting out. He didn't get it. Mm. He just flat didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're young, you're a captain in the army, you're well married, you got a credit card, you're driving a Jaguar automobile. What else could you ask what for? You possibly. Want? What do you Had want? you lost your mind? <laughs> that was a setback. He got used to it after a while. But uh, I don't know what my best day in the army was. I had so many I, that uh, uh, it's hard to say. Maybe the day uh, I got married. Got married in uniform. The That's white pretty one good that one. nobody wears anymore. Yeah. How often did you get home during your service years? Well, my folks um, retired and they came to see us pretty much. My wife and I have three children. We didn't have any children until uh, after I got out. She was a nurse in the Army and was stationed at Fort Benning. And um, I got out a year ahead of her. And so she, she lagged me a year. We had our first child during that year. Uh. And then um, her folks were down pretty often. So we, she was from New York, so we didn't have to. We went up there every year to see her people. So you got to My see folks, families. Yeah, I got, I got to see family right much. I mean, I'm from a military family, and they know you got to move it if you want to see them. Yeah. You know, they just, 
There it's it part is. Of it. If that, you want to see your kids, you got to yeah. do what they want to do. They might not be around. As well, much. I think you have good taste. I'm married to a nurse practitioner. Great. She's still working. Nurses are eminently practical. People. Oh. Yeah, they they do all the healing. You yeah. Know, it's, it's oh yeah. I'd rather have a nurse. Healing. I'd rather have a nurse practitioner that an MD any day. They listen to you. I didn't know what a physician's assistant was until I got in the Army and they started a program and started creating those warrant officer PAs. They were great. Yeah. I go see a PA now. Yeah. Um, I just think how little our medical system would cost. If every time you had a runny nose, your child had a runny nose, you got to go see a medic. Yeah. And then he's trained to tell you if you need to go see the PA and he knows whether or not you know to, to go see a GP or what kind of specialist you need to see. All you need to do is see that nurse practitioner. She can write prescriptions on anything you need. And if she's send, in the deep water out of realm, she'll send you to somebody knows She'll how. send you to a specialist if right. you need it. Yeah, that's that's uh Yeah, there were when I when I went down there to Fort Polk, there wasn't any housing in those days down there, so you had to, uh, you had some choices, and the choice I made was live in this uh, trailer park that they had off post. It was owned by this uh, crusty old retired major. <laughs> I think he had about 40 nurses in there and about half a dozen Red Cross uh, ladies, and it was all singles. <laughs> Those were some happy days in the Army. I bet. I met my wife. Yeah. She set that hook. Do you have any difficulty readjusting to life after the military? Wasn't easy. And uh, because I was into the military and getting into that uh, special forces unit over in Alabama as soon as, pretty much, not too too long after I got out was really good for me because it was filled with people like me that didn't want to be in the peacetime army but wanted to keep a hand in it. Yeah. So I, I saw, I met a great bunch of people over there. And then, uh, but yeah, it took me several years to demill. My son-in-law was in the British Army and uh, he had a commission in the Territorial Army and then went to the professional course at Sandhurst for a year when he graduated from college. They had figured out how to create an officer in one year, a polished professional officer, which they can do in one year. It takes us a lot longer than that. Yeah. And he served in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and was in the Royal Horse Artillery and and was in some very distinguished, and I, th I think the British Army might be a little over-professionalized in some ways, but uh, really tough adjustment getting out because he gave up England and gave up the Army to come here and, and be uh, married to my daughter. Mm. So he had, a, he had an even tougher transition than I did. If you've been in good units, if you've had the kind of uh, leadership exposures that I've got, it's hard to find in the civilian world. They're out there, but it's harder to find. See, I think it's hard to, I think it's hard to make the adjustment. If you were in... Did your combat, military uh, experience change you and affect your life afterward, for good or for less good? Made me. Yeah. It, um, I can go back and benchmark against guys that, uh, or contrast myself, I wouldn't say against, with fellows that I went to military school with and that I served with from here and there. And I would say that uh, I was much more responsive to the military than a lot of people were. So, yes, it. Uh, I'm, I'm in a business now where the uh, situational aspects are much like the military. In fact, a judge one time said there's no place where decisions are made with less information than construction, except for the military. The, they have an expression now called VUCA, which I find highly useful. V-U-C-A, do you know that acronym? Mm -hmm. 
volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Yeah. And that's, it's all the bad juju, you know, the things that yeah. you don't know, but you still have to make decisions and take action, even though you're in a very imperfect information situation. And I'd say that uh, I have applied on a regular basis in my business. I started my own business about uh, over 20 years ago. I like small units, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm leading a small unit in commerce. Have you visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? What are your thoughts when you go there? Somber. Somber. Yeah. It's unsettling to me. I also, my Uncle Blanton served in the 11th Airborne. He was younger than my dad, but we went there for his funeral at Arlington. And I was able to see, uh, the I'd been to Arlington, but when I saw the uh, bugler and the uh, horse-drawn caisson and the firing party done in a way that would have brought great credit to any military formation anywhere on this planet. It was very sobering experience, as Arlington is, and I'm sure you've been there many times, but it's a, uh, military is a serious part of society, and the Army is in a lot of ways the backbone of this country. During your service career, did you ever see any cutting edge technology, advances in weaponry, communications, medicine? Astonishing changes. When I was in Korea, we were using recoilless rifles. Camp cases within artillery range of North Korea. Shit, soul is in range. So when you're at Camp Casey <clears throat> in a tank-heavy brigade and you're the anti-tank guy, the only one, <laughs> uh, it's a high-profile position. And, and I decided that, uh, you know, if you look at how the Korean Peninsula is organized for its defense in those days, very serious situation. And uh, I became uh, committed to anti-tank operations at that point in time. Well, I went back to Fort Benning, and uh, we had to tow anti-tank guided missile, which was an, and I'd been introduced to that in Korea because my platoon was selected to be the first one to get it and then introduce it to the other people. Um, just an astonishing change in technology. I agreed with it. I learned how to use it. One of the things that I did was, and I trained all kinds of people. Um, I trained a bunch of Bedouins one time in how to fire the tow, 25 of them, sent a platoon over. They stopped him in England and bought him a suit and brought him to us. These were people that were in the National Guard, and their job was to protect the princess. Saudis? Yes. Yeah. Their job was to protect the princess from the regular army. So they were chosen for their familial uh, allegiances. They carried those daggers. This was a pretty rough-looking lot. I'd say the most mechanical experience they had might have been driving their old 88 or pushing a wheelbarrow. They had no concept of any machinery. Whipping a camel. Electrical, those kinds, of, yeah. Those kinds of things were beyond their grasp because they'd never been exposed to it. They live in tents in the desert, literally. They got an old 88, but they don't have any technological background and very little education, mostly religious education. We figured out how to get them to hit a tank at two and a half miles away just as well as we could teach our own gunners. And that was a great uh, experience for me. We couldn't talk to them. First thing we found out is none of them wouldn't pay any attention to the other ones. Rang didn't mean anything to them. 
So we went out and hired three, or somebody did, three retired Jordanian colonels that could speak their language, and they would listen to them. So we had to do everything through those guys. <laughs> and uh, it was a heck of an experience for right. me, and that technology was astonishing. And in my opinion, the tank is an out-of-date piece of equipment, and there's no need of one anymore. A tanker um, up against uh, an anti-tank guided missile, it's, a, it's over. There's no no way to survive it. Not competitive. The Russians had 42,000 tanks in Eastern Europe when I was in the Army. We had 7,000, counting everything in NATO. It was a pretty difficult assignment. You've heard of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration. You're part of it today. Well, I, I don't, I, I haven't kept up so much um, with the commemorative aspects of the Army. I mean, I, I continue to read things about the Army. I'm concerned about the Army. I think it's too small. Um, I think we got a lot to learn from the Vietnam War. And, uh, you know, the journalists are always talking about writing first draft of history. I think they got most of it wrong. Um, you, know, you ought to read my book. Well, I, I read the one about General Moore. Yep. And I'm, I'm uh, I think at the, at the end of the day, you know, 100 years after, not the 50th, but at the 100th, a guy like me spent most of his life steeped in the Cold War. Most of my life I've been working and paying taxes to finance the Cold War. And I think that the, the uh, Vietnam, the Korea and the Vietnam conflict and many other conflicts around the world in the historical context is subsets of our struggles with communism. We won. We need to hang on to that victory. They'll take it back. And I got, think they're in the middle of the process we right We've got to guard now. against that. And then nobody else is going to do it but the Army. When it gets right down to it, you get nose to nose with these guys. That's what it's going to take. This nation building thing, we have done nation building successfully in Japan, in Germany, South Korea, and in the Confederacy. But the precursor to those successful nation building exercises were we slaughtered their armies, decimated them, we burned their countries down, we occupied them with thousands of people. We told them how to behave, and we stuck around long enough to make sure it caught on. <laughs> we can't do that anymore. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate, I appreciate you the work in. you're doing. You received the veteran's lapel pin? I don't think so. This one. Kind of modeled after the what they called the ruptured duck after World War II. All of them came home. It was an official Army discharge lapel pin. And if you didn't have one in your lapel in '46, you couldn't get elected dog catcher. So we thought right. the Vietnam era people should have one, and there it is. And on the back is engraved these words. A grateful nation thanks and honors you. Well, it was a, it was a great privilege for me to serve. Let me get this Frankly. mic off and I'll stand up and stick it to you. Great. You Put want, it on me. You want a blood stick? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's optional. Let me see if I can see where it is. There we go. Yeah, you're good right there. If I can get it through this corduroy. There we go. Slowly, slowly. It's cold out there, you know. My blood's getting a little thinner now. Yeah, than yeah to. mine too. Damn. Yeah, there's a lapel. Yeah, I'm trying to get it on that sticker. There. There. You got it? Got it. That's a familiar sound. Thank you very <laughs> much, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you today. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs>